Thank you. That's a <laughs> So I'm part of the production of Apollo, and uh, I'll say Penn is a really incredible place, in part to due to Rujna, but also to all of you. I think, uh, you know, I had six meetings today. I think all, every meeting I learned something really new and different. You know, I was talking to Rujna about it, you know, and the folks in the front row, I, I think every meeting I learned something different and, and cool and something I want to say for it. Um, as Rudna mentioned, you know, I got my start at Berkeley uh, as a physics student, and I was working on particle physics and, uh, you know, doing some weird research on supersymmetry. So that was how I got my start. And then near my senior year, you know, my dad asked me a question, what are you going to do with your life? You can't be a physicist. Physicists don't make any money. So I took that to heart and I started reaching out to faculty members. And in, in Berkeley and Eeks, the faculty member at the top of the, the list you know, alphabetically was Rujna Baichi. So I sent her an email <laughs> and I said, hey, you know, I'm interested in doing research. I see that you're doing some computer vision stuff. I would love, you know, to get an opportunity. Immediately, I got a response, right? And I didn't, you know, I didn't know what I was getting into. I was a senior. And in fact, you know, I did a, a lot of interesting stuff there as a senior, but I applied to many graduate programs and didn't get into any of them because I applied to EECS and I just had a bunch of physicists write me letters of recommendation. I didn't understand the game at that point. And then Rujna looked at me and laughed at me and said, you know, you should have asked me. I'm in a bunch of national academies. I could have helped you. In any case, that's how I got started. Um, and in fact, you know, through that time, as Rujna was mentioning, I had the opportunity to try many, many weird and different things. And so just as an illustration of the weird and different things I got to try, you know, this was... Northern California, they dropped me in the northern part of Michigan in February and they said, make the NPC work. And you know, this is the kind of adventure that Bruginet's group allowed you to explore. And in fact, this wasn't even my first project. My first project was something even weirder, where essentially what we were working on was trying to do, you know, the metaverse before the metaverse was the metaverse. And that was, you know, essentially this idea of tele-immersion, which was trying to construct these 3D reconstructions in real time in a distributed fashion. You know, and here's us working with some artists essentially to try to make this happen. And uh, that's me. You can see my long, beautiful hair um, sitting there, you know, dressed appropriately, which I usually am wearing a hoodie. Um, and we were, you know, trying to do this long dance experiment where essentially we had these dancers in two different spaces, you know, and we would reconstruct them in the same 3D world. I think this was back in 2006 or seven. And we did lots of interesting stuff. You know, if you know who Merce Cunningham is, a really interesting uh, dance, you know, dancing uh, person. I don't have the music. <laughs> I was trying to dig it out yesterday, but I couldn't find it. And so, you know, we were trying to do these distributed spatial stuff. It didn't end up becoming any part of my thesis. But in fact, you know, this was one of the many things that I learned along the way at, at Berkeley. And, you know, it wasn't just about, you know, trying to hit some metrics of writing a lot of papers. We were on a floor with a lot of really interesting people, you know, some of the guys who invented Nerf, or you know, ended up going and becoming astronauts and whatnot. It was really cool stuff. But you know, we were learning all sorts of weird and interesting things, and that was an opportunity that I'm uh, fortunate for. Now, I don't really do that kind of stuff as much anymore. But you know, you still see some of the vision work that you know I did back then, now appearing in in uh, my research. So, example, for example, you know, one of the things we're close to publishing or in published now is this algorithm called Loner, which is basically us doing real time. Uh, depth reconstruction just using LIDAR and using NERF, so basically developing novel view synthesis stuff and running real-time SLAM. So this is us essentially doing re reconstruction here. And I mean, the field has evolved many, many times forward. And part of this work is us being able to do this because of all of the crazy stuff that you know has been developed in the interim. But if I didn't have that experience with Rujana, I wouldn't have learned or known enough about vision to be able to do this kind of stuff. So anyway, really cool stuff, but that's not what I'm going to speak about today. So today, I'm going to speak about the work of, of these folks here. Um, so Simon, or Ipe, is sitting up front here. He's actually going to be featured prominently later on. But the primary work in this, in this talk is going to be primarily Pat, Shreyas, Bohau, and John. And Shreyas is now a faculty member at Georgia Tech. Uh, John and Bohau have done a lot of the work here. And so we'll talk about how this stuff works and whatnot. But the others have contributed as well. So the goal of my research most broadly is how do we try to develop autonomy systems that are robust and behave reliably 
And in fact, you know, one way to think about this or try to understand what robustness means in this context is to look at, at humans driving. So this is human beings driving, and these are crash statistics presented or collected by NHTSA, so the National Highway Transportation Safety Administration. This is the number of fatalities per 100 million miles driven. And in fact, NHTSA has done an incredible job of collecting statistics from 1920 all the way up to 2014 here. In fact, the statistics have gone up a little bit. That is, in recent years, the number of fatalities per 100 million miles has increased a little bit. But in fact, this is not plotted on a log scale or anything. This is literally 24 fatalities per 100 million miles. Down here at the bottom, it's about 1.1. And I think now the recent numbers are about 1.5 fatalities per 100 million miles driven. Humans are amazing at driving. And that's the thing I want you to want to convince you of. This isn't just driving in Phoenix. This is driving everywhere in that snowy, you know, Sault Ste. Marie weather in Michigan, in the cold, in a blizzard. Humans are amazing at driving. And in fact, if you look at self-driving car companies, this is Waymo. You know, they published their statistics up to 2019. I was trying to dig up if they published more over the past few days. You know, you can imagine that they probably maybe quadrupled this number in the past, you know, three years. But in fact, this is primarily Glendale, Arizona, San Francisco now. And a little bit of LA, and you can see that they're you know about at 40 million miles, maybe if you include that quadruple multiplier. In fact, they really haven't driven very much. They haven't even driven very much to collect the types of statistics we need to have to say anything about them being safe or not. And so, really, you know, this is one platform that we've been spending a lot of time thinking about making autonomous. But you know, you can imagine trying to automate or you know try to make robust all of these other types of platforms that are working in or around, around humans. And in fact, that's sort of the research question that I'm going to speak a lot about today. How far can we get without just cheating? That is, doing this real-world experiment where we put cars in front of people and see if they work reliably or not. Can we actually prove theorems and get this, you know, result a little bit further? And so, um, the way you know that's helpful to start thinking about this is to understand a little bit about how planning and control works for these kinds of systems. And in general, you know, we as you know roboticists or you know, control theorists think about this problem in terms of a hierarchy. That is, we use model abstractions to think about different parts of the planning problem in pieces. So at the highest level, we have a high-level planner. Mid-level, we have a trajectory planner. And at the lowest level, we have a tracking controller. The idea here is just like how you and I would drive. If I asked you to go to New York, the first thing you'd probably do is pull up your, your phone, go to Google Maps, type in the address that you wanted to go to. And what that's giving you is essentially turn-by-turn -turn instructions of how to get from grass flat to New York. That information you and your brain translate into trajectories that you actually ask your car to follow. That is, drive straight, you accelerate, you make a left turn, etc. That information is taken by the car and essentially translated into something that is realizable, this tracking controller. And in fact, this story of trying to say something about the safety of this entire hierarchy is a really hard and important question that we as you know, roboticists or dynamical systems people have been thinking about for a long period of time. And generally speaking, the strategy we've arrived at is focused really on that trajectory planning problem. That is, we understand a lot about how to build tracking controllers. The computer scientists have taught us a lot about building high-level planners. But the question is really, how do we generate that trajectory that follows that turn-by-turn -turn instruction? And the way that you can sort of think about it is I'm in this ego vehicle here, and I get some sensor information like this, and I need to design a plan that allows me to go from here to there. Okay? And in fact, as I keep going forward, essentially what I'm doing is collecting new information and then planning something in this sort of receding horizon fashion. That is, I don't get to know everything about the universe before I start moving, right? So I have to keep planning as I'm going along in order for this trajectory essentially to be safe and realizable in my system. And in fact, you know, what we can do is write that down as a, a simple optimization problem. So something like minimize, you know, my car's position at some final time, subject to essentially being dynamically feasible and avoiding, you know, running into another car. And, you know, the real challenge here that I want to, come, you know, get across is that this constraint here, this dynamical systems constraint is really the hard one. It's the one we need to spend a lot of time thinking about. And in fact, our strategy for thinking about it generally, not always, but generally has been to take this differential equation model and then discretize it into some simple discrete time sort of representation of the system. And so here I could write this down as something like forward Euler, where essentially I've taken my continuous time differential equation and represented it as some sort of simple, you know, discrete time system. And in fact, what that means then is that I'm replacing this constraint, this dynamic feasibility constraint with this representation of that constraint. And in fact, 
that propagates everywhere, right? In all of the pieces of my optimization problem, now I replace that constraint with something about safety, which I can only verify at these discrete time instances, right? And so this is the challenge. We've essentially gone from something that was defined over continuous time, which was a hard optimization problem to solve, and I've replaced it with an easier to solve optimization problem. But now, you know, essentially I'm not able to say anything about safety, and that's the real big challenge for me. And in fact, that's kind of the big issue for us. How do we actually solve this problem? And in fact, if we solve it poorly, that is, we have you know, a loose number of time steps representation for the dynamics, well, it may be an easy optimization problem to solve, but I can't say anything between these different time instances. And on the other hand, if I make the discretization finer, that's great. I get a better reflection of the true dynamics of the system, but now my optimization problem takes a really long time to solve, right? And there's this unpleasant trade-off now between what it means to satisfy this optimization problem and the true dynamics of the system and solving my optimization problem. And we as engineers know, whenever you can make an undesirable trade-off, you'll generally make it very poorly, right? And in fact, this is the type of trade-off that I would prefer that we avoid, right? Can we solve these optimization problems while still saying something about safety without sacrificing real-time performance? And in fact, the way that I'm going to try to do that or overcome that trade-off is essentially by trying to pose a different style of optimization problem and use something called a reachable set. Okay? And that's essentially what I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about today. In fact, several years ago, I actually arrived at, at, at Penn virtually and actually spoke about like sort of the first generation of these algorithms. And I'll talk a little bit about how that first generation worked. And what I'm going to speak about today is sort of the second generation, how we've really been able to push the limits of these, of these algorithms. Before I do that, I'm going to spend just a few minutes giving a little bit of background on how people think about this problem. That is saying something about the safety of this tri-level hierarchy. So in fact, generally speaking, the way that people have thought about the safety in this problem is by focusing on this tracking controller level. That is, can we say something about the safety of the controller that is realizing the trajectory that my optimization problem has prescribed? And in fact, there's been a lot of different techniques to do this. So for example, there's these beautiful techniques from Matthias Alcock's group, where essentially what they do is they take that trajectory, they take a controller, and they essentially try in real time to construct a reachable set for that system. And in that instance, all they're doing is essentially verifying that a particular trajectory can be realized safely. They're not actually doing any planning. It's more of a check method, which is why I call it check up here. But in fact, there's been other methods like called correct methods, which essentially take that trajectory and then modify it in some way in real time by essentially modifying the control input that tracks that trajectory. And as a result, that generates a slightly different trajectory. And in fact, there's been a litany of papers to try to do this kind of work. So the classic one or classic set of ones is called reference governors, which has sort of been a little bit lost in history. But Ilya Kolmanovsky and uh, Gilbert and Vishigian have developed these methods. They're really beautiful. They do lots of interesting things. More recently, and very popularly, these control barrier function methods have been a good alternative, again, to these reference governor methods. There's, they share a lot in common. More recently, there's been methods like Fast Track, which Claire Tomlin's group has developed, which basically try to solve sort of a Hamilton Jacobi Bellman style problem, which try to balance and basically figure out how to do this correction by solving a, a high or a complicated PDE. Instead, what I'm going to do today is talk about methods that try to ensure safety at this level. And again, there's been a lot of work in this area recently. In fact, some of it was uh, by uh, someone I worked with at MIT, Ani Majumdar, who's now at, at uh, Princeton. These funnel library methods. We'll talk a little bit more about these later on in my talk. But for right now, I'm going to talk about this thing that I presented the last time I was here called reachability based trajectory design to remind you what that is and how it worked and how we've improved upon it. The basic idea is that we start off with our robot model here. And what we do is we parameterize the space of trajectories that this robot can follow. Okay? And in fact, each of these trajectory parameters corresponds to a motion for the robot. And in fact, what I can do is instead of just parameterizing a single trajectory at a time, I can actually generate a continuum of trajectory parameters and essentially generate a volume and configuration space for this robot. And in fact, this reachable set, I'm going to generate it offline. It's going to be something that essentially says, if you plug in this trajectory parameter, this is the portion of this volume you get. So it's going to be a type of function that I'm going to be able to evaluate. But constructing this function is something that in RTD we used to do offline. Next, at runtime, and they have an obstacle like this one up here. Well, in fact, we can back project that over here into this trajectory parameter space. 
and essentially pose an optimization problem over here on the left hand side that essentially says, well, look, if you want to get to this desired configuration, in fact, you can solve an optimization problem that looks like this, where this constraint is really nice and representable, and you can actually compute a bunch of derivatives with it, and as a result, run real time optimization with it in a nice way. Again, this reachable set representation that we constructed, it was done offline, but it was done in a conservative fashion, meaning that the true behavior of the system was contained in the actual reachable set we constructed. Because of that, any solution to this optimization problem would correspond to a trajectory that was actually realizable by the system in a provably safe manner. And then we could set up some structure in the problem to ensure that we were actually persistently feasible. And as a result, we could solve this problem quite elegantly. And in fact, what we were able to do is show that this method worked for many, many, many different kinds of systems. And in fact, there are a few systems back here that are hidden by this. But in fact, you know, we have this working on, on a, a rover system. We have it working on these walking robots like this one. We had it working on quad loaders. We had it working on manipulation robots. We had it working on many, many, many different systems. And in fact, our code was available online. And I'll joke just partly that, you know, the reason that Shreyas has a job at Georgia Tech is because he showed that he could just take this method and essentially churn it and apply it immediately to many, many different systems. And in fact, it was really great um, and very powerful. Uh, but what we realized is that there were some interesting problems with it. And to explain those interesting problems, I'll point back at Rujna and tell a funny story. You know, Rujna always jokes that sometimes when she asks a question, that question can make you, you know, think and have re rethink your entire research agenda for six months. And in fact, in this instance, you know, we were thinking about these things and Jesse Grizzle during one of my seminars asked me a question. He said, hey, why are you doing this? Like, this is an interesting idea, but what's the, you know, interesting gap here? And let me point out the gap he was pointing at, which is that, you know, when we apply RTD, what we would do is we would take a full order model like this one. And essentially what we would do is bound it using a simplified model like this one. And what I mean by bounding is that we would come up with upper and lower bounds on what the true behavior of this full order system would look like. So in fact, this was like we were constructing a type of bi-simulation relationship between this full order model and this simplified model. Why did we do that? Well, at the end of the day, the way that we were constructing these reachable sets was by using semi-definite programming. And if you've ever used semi-definite programming, you know that it doesn't scale very well. Okay? And so one of the challenges we had is that we wanted to construct these reachable sets for complex systems, but in fact, it wasn't working well for high dimensional systems. So we would use approximations. And in fact, because we were using approximations and generating these bounds, essentially our results were just as only as good as the bounds we were able to generate. Now we could show we could do a lot with it, but Jesse pointed out, hey, you're using the simplified model. How do you actually know that it's cutting it? You have to really do lots of approximations. You're saying these things about guarantees. How do you know for sure? And so that was an interesting point. The other thing we'd have to do is do lots of our reach set computation offline. And so as a result, we were just as good as the library, which was continuum, like a continuum of possibilities, but we were only as good as that library that we computed offline. And so what I'm going to do today is talk about a technique that addresses these two issues. And essentially, it's going to be called armor. So autonomous, robust manipulation, deoptimization with uncertainty aware reachability. Long name, but armor is better. In any case, the sort of key three, there are three key insights here are we're going to develop a robust controller to operate safely despite model uncertainty. We're going to do real-time reachable set computation. I'm going to show you what that looks like using this thing called polynomial zone effect. And we're going to use a full order model. And in fact, near the end of my talk, I'm going to show you us doing this with a 54-dimensional state-based model of digit. Okay, if we get there. <laughs> that Claire Tobin has several students, several PhDs who were trying to use that nonsense. Yeah. So to reach this point, you know, computing these reachable sets has generally been a very difficult problem in the dynamical systems community. It's like if you can hold on to a reachable set, you can solve many, many problems. What I'll point out is, you know, this if you write this problem in its general abstractness, it's tremendously difficult to solve. So we're going to hammer it, hammer at it with very nice assumptions that will allow us to apply this in a nice way. This does get us really far and further than I think people have been able to get you know, for these kinds of systems, but under a, a class of assumptions that work well for the systems that we care about. So I'm going to talk about armor. There's going to be four pieces. I'm going to focus on the manipulation question just because it'll allow me to simplify notation quite a bit. 
But in fact, at the end, I'll show you it working on vehicles. I'll show you it working on walking robots and more. Okay. So first, let's start off with a model. So we'll start off with our robot here, our friend, Fetch. It has n configuration variables. We'll have an actual trajectory to the system, a desired trajectory, and then an error trajectory. And in fact, we're going to have a bunch of different model parameters for the system, like mass, center of mass, inertia. And in fact, we're going to stack them all together into this single object that I'm going to call an inertial vector. And in fact, what we're going to do is we're going to allow model uncertainty to exist in our system. In fact, if you played around with walking robots, it's quite difficult to model them perfectly. Agility will hand you a model of what they think the system looks like, but in fact, it's not accurate. And so we need the ability to deal with model uncertainty well. And the way that I'm going to do that is by using interval arithmetic. Okay? And for instance, the way that this works is I'm going to define an interval as follows. It's going to be basically an upper and lower piece. And in fact, what I can do is basically intervalize all of these different model parameters, like the mass, center of mass, and inertia, and essentially create this interval inertial vector. And that, that increments your state. That's right. It's going to describe essentially all of the possibilities for this particular model. And what I'm going to do now is make two assumptions. The first one is that the robot's true inertial parameters are unknown to me. Okay, it's fair. Second, there exists a vector of nominal inertial parameters. That's my best guess of what I think the true parameters are. And then I lied. There's one more assumption. I'm going to assume that delta and delta not actually live inside of this interval I'm starting off with. Fair. Okay. So now I'll go to my robot dynamics. They look a little bit like this. Hopefully you've all taken a robot dynamics course. This is how robot dynamics look like. I have an inertial matrix, a Coriolis matrix, a gravity matrix. I'm going to parameterize these by delta as well, right? And in fact, in this instance, what's going to end up happening for now, I'm going to assume that all the joints are revolute. In fact, if you look at the robots I've shown before, they're not all revolute. It's not a problem, but it'll make my notation a little bit simpler. The second assumption, I'm going to assume that the model is fully actuated. That's a humongous assumption. In fact, in a few slides, I'll show an example where we're not fully actuated. It'll turn out that most of the work that I present here will generalize in a clean way. It'll be quite time consuming if I presented that general case here. So. The first thing I'm going to do is present this idea of a robust controller. The idea is as simple as this. I'll have some desired trajectory. I'll have the actual trajectory. I'll subtract from the computing error. I'll pass that to my robust controller to generate an input that I pass to my robot. In fact, I'm going to break my robust controller into two pieces. One is a nominal controller, and the other one is this robust input. The idea here is if I go back to my robot model, well, in fact, I can do this algorithm called recursive Newton Euler. Recursive Newton Euler is this amazing algorithm developed in part by Roy Featherstone, which allows us to essentially compute sort of two things at once. First, I, frame, I generate these frame transformations that describe the robot dynamics. Second, when I do a forward pass through this robot dynamics, I can actually calculate things like acceleration. But when I do a backward pass, I can do things like calculate the forces in the system. In fact, this algorithm is extraordinarily efficient. So if I have a parallel tree, I can actually do this computation as a for loop and it'll actually pass through without having me generate a really large inertial matrix that I have to do inversion on or all these other things. This algorithm is really elegant. In fact, developed you know, decades ago. And in fact, this has been a form sort of the cornerstone of how we develop our controller. So if I return back to my robot model, well, in fact, what I can do is I can take in sort of the trajectory and I have a typo here, Q dot and Q double dot. And actually, I can apply recursive Newton Euler to actually calculate the input that needs to realize that particular trajectory in the system. So, what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to apply this strategy to actually construct that nominal controller. So, to describe how that works, let me define this thing called a modified velocity trajectory and a modified error trajectory. Well, I'm going to create this passivity based controller, which is going to serve as my nominal control input. And the way that I'm going to construct it is by applying essentially recursive Newton Euler on it. So, what that means is I'm going to take Q, Q dot, QA dot, QA double dot, and my nominal parameters, my best guess. I'm going to apply recursive Newton Euler to actually construct tau. Why is that important? Well, it's going to allow me to construct this nominal input on the order of about 15 kilohertz, which is what I need to operate this robot really fast. Right. So, that's great. Well, now remember, this is my best guess for what the robot parameters actually look like. In fact, the true robot parameters are unknown to me. And so, in fact, my best guess may not actually realize that trajectory that I want to see in the system. So, 
what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to construct a robust control input. And the way that I'm going to do that is by taking a look at this how that I found on the previous slide and this V. And in fact, I have these unknown dynamics. And I'm going to basically do a little bit of a subtraction here to create this object that I'm going to call an error equation. And I'm going to be left with this W term. And W in this instance is basically equal to this formula. What is it? It's just the difference between the actual parameters of the system and the true parameters of their system and their effect on the dynamics of the system. Okay, so W. Now again, this W is something that I need to estimate in some way in real time in order to actually be able to do control safely. Why? Well, again, I don't actually know what the true parameters of my system are, right? So I need some way to estimate how wrong I am, and I need to do it in some sort of worst case way in order to actually be able to do safe control. And in fact, the good news is, naively, that can be written down as the recursive Dude Euler algorithm of this delta term subtracted from the recursive Dude Euler algorithm for that delta naught term. But in fact, I don't get to know what delta is here, right? It's something that's completely unknown to me. So in fact, I need a worst case estimate of it. And in fact, the way that we're going to do that is by replacing our recursive Newton Euler algorithm with something I'm going to call the interval recursive Newton Euler algorithm. And the idea is essentially, I'm going to take this interval recursive Newton Euler algorithm, and the only thing that's going to be different is I'm going to replace that delta with my interval representation of delta. And it'll turn out that because of the way that recursive Newton Euler works, in fact, that computation is going to be very, very fast still. It's just going to be lots of interval arithmetic. And in fact, the amazing thing is I can actually show that that's going to be a worst case disturbance into my system. And that worst case disturbance is an upper bound for that disturbance vector that I showed on the previous slide. Okay. So interval arithmetic usually uh, is very pessimistic. It's really the opposite of covariance estimation in Kalman theory. Uh, yeah. Because it doesn't, it always fits a cube, not a polytope, right? That's true. So in fact, in a few slides, I'm going to describe a, a generalization of it. Um, that's going to be called possible. But what I would say for the moment is, in fact, because of the way that our dynamics look, it's actually not so over, it's not so pessimistic. Um, so I'll show you some examples where we'll have about 5% model uncertainty. And even despite that 5% model uncertainty, we can still construct tight enough bounds to do useful things. But it's a go back to this time when it was, it was too conservative. What we'll show is it's not so conservative empirically. Right? Maybe a similar question. So the W thing was the difference of the uh, is a Jacobian, right? Uh, at delta naught, if um, delta was in the neighborhood of delta naught. So it's it's not quite a Jacobian. It's just the difference between the two. It's a I mean, uh, in the worst case, it would be a disturbance between the two uh, predictions, right? So I guess what I'm trying to ask is. Uh, uh, this should already give you a way to estimate an ellipse around delta naught, not a cube, uh, by looking at the directions. Yeah, so I guess what you're asking is sort of more of like a Bayesian optimization question, which is like, can you re-estimate what your interval looks like in yes. real time? Yes. Excellent. In fact, we've done that. I'm not going to present it here, but that is something that is like an extension, which is basically a version of like, I run an experiment and see what my actual desired trajectory look like, or my actual trajectory look like, and can I update the parameters of my system at runtime? Um, I won't present it here, but in fact, that is something we've been exploring as well. Good questions. Any other questions? Yes, please. Uh, just to clarify, uh, I think it's maybe basic. Do you need to evaluate using around that because the algorithm or, or the all the clients of the yeah. yeah, so let me repeat the question just to confirm. You're asking, is interval recursive due more there? Is it just running this algorithm on all the corners here? In fact, it isn't. So, like what we're gonna do is actually, and I haven't described it well here, but essentially do a bunch of interval arithmetic, which is basically operations on interval matrices or interval objects. Those operations will look really similar to the stuff over here. So, in fact, I'm not discretizing the space and constructing sort of, you know, an evaluation on each of the points. I'm actually doing uh, a worst case analysis. So, the last thing we'll do is we'll define a sort of a robust input here. Um, this is going to look like a standard robust input, which is essentially defined by sort of a, a KP and a KI and essentially an error term. 
Uh, this is not too fancy. In fact, we have a slightly different version of this more recently, uh, but I'll leave that out for now. The important thing is, you know, we can plug these two pieces together. And what we can do is essentially ensure that this error trajectory is bounded for all time. And in fact, what we're going to do is prove a theorem that that error trajectory is bounded for all time, but we need one final assumption. And it's about this inertia matrix. So the first thing I'll, I'll remind you all of is that this inertia matrix for a single choice of delta is always going to be uniformly bounded. Um, so in fact, you know, I can take a minimum and maximum eigenvalue over this the configuration variables of this thing, and the minimum eigenvalue is always going to be greater than zero, and the maximum eigenvalue is always going to be less than infinity. In fact, you know, you can write down a really nice sort of PSD style representation for what that means over here on the right hand side. It's a really nice paper from Mark Spong in the 80s, essentially showing this result. In fact, what we're going to show, or what we're going to argue, and I have a typo here, this should be an interval. If the minimum eigenvalue across the entire interval of inertial parameters is greater than zero, then the modified error trajectory is uniformly ultimately bounded. And let me explain what that means. So there exists a finite time T1 such that the error is always going to be inside of this ball for all time greater than T1. And in fact, all that requires me to do is essentially compute this maximum eigenvalue at the, the height of my interval and the minimum eigenvalue at the lowest point of my interval. Take the square root of that. Kp is a parameter I get to choose. And once I'm done, I know that this result is true. In fact, there's a slightly more positive, even more powerful result, which is, in fact, if R of zero is less than the ultimate bound, then R of T is going to stay inside of the ultimate bound forever. And in fact, that means that the error is also going to stay inside of that bound forever. Why is this so useful? Well, in fact, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take that ultimate bound and I'm now going to plug it into the reachable set objects I'm going to construct and use that to ensure that I can plan in real time in a safe manner. And that's what I'm going to talk about next. So again, we're going to parameterize our trajectories like we did in the original version of RTD. Reminder, this is what that looks like. I have a time interval, 0 to t, f. I have some desired trajectory for my system, for joint i. And in fact, I have a particular trajectory parameter, and that's going to correspond to some motion for that joint. This is what a desired trajectory looks like for us. In fact, we want to do receding horizon planning. So in fact, there is a finite time t before which we need to plan our next plan, right? That's a thing that exists for us because we want to do all of our planning in this receding horizon framework. So again, the robot must find a new plan within time t plan. And in fact, if it isn't able to find such a plan, it must execute the previous plan, right? That's its only option. In fact, in order to ensure that that previous plan is going to be safe, I'm missing one thing here, I'm going to need that that previous plan actually brings the robot to a stop. Okay? So that's one other assumption I'm missing here. And the last thing I'm going to require is that this desired trajectory is an analytic function. So analytic just means that it has a Taylor expansion associated with it. So how am I going to use this to construct a reachable set? Well, I'm going to use these objects called polynomial zonotopes, which I'm going to define now here. So polynomial zonotope, I'm going to show one in R2. It's going to be defined by a center and then a generator like this, and then a generator like this. Each of these generators are multiplied by an indeterminate, and that indeterminate is allowed to be between minus one and one. This object here on the left-hand side is a classical zonotope. Okay. What makes it polynomial is this next term I'm going to add, which is allowing essentially a mixture of the indeterminates in this first term. And what that does now is it allows me to construct these really interesting, weird shapes that are not necessarily convex. Okay, so this is kind of the straight generalization of a zonotope. All I'm doing now is allowing indeterminates to fix in some way. So I'm going to write that down in, you know, in this form. And generally speaking, I'll treat the center as sort of the first or zeroth generator of the system. In fact, there's a bunch of different operations I can do on polynomial zonotopes that allow them to behave like closed you know, sets. So what do I mean by that? Let's say that I have this polynomial zonotope and this polynomial zonotope. Well, let's say I wanted to construct a Minkowski sum of these two. Well, in fact, that Minkowski sum is also going to generate a polynomial zonotope. The only thing that's happened is essentially now I've essentially increased the number of generators I have. So 
I'm going to get the same types of Minkowski sum properties that I cared about earlier, you know, with classical zonotopes, with these polynomial zonotopes as well. So what does that look like? Let's say I have this polynomial zonotope and this polynomial zonotope. Well, I'm just going to add essentially this generators together, and what's going to end up happening is I'm going to produce this polynomial zonotope over here on the right hand side. So I take a point here, I add it to a point here, and it lives inside of this set. And that operation is going to be closed under this polynomial zonotope representation. In fact, I can do that not just for addition. Is that me? Yeah, yeah, for some reason, the video stopped. Okay. Go okay. Ahead. So I can do that with multiplication as well. So if I take these two polynomial zonotopes and multiply them together, it's as if I'm basically multiplying together the indeterminates now and just creating a higher degree polynomial zonotope. Okay, and in fact, that's also going to be closed under multiplication. So, for example, this is a polynomial zonotope and this is a polynomial zonotope. And let's say this was larger than minus one to one, this was larger than minus one to one. Well, in fact, in that instance, I'm going to produce this larger polynomial zonotope, which is going to represent the multiplication of points inside of this set. In fact, I can do even more. So let's say that I wanted to increase the supremum or infimum of this polynomial zonotope. Well, in fact, all I need to do is essentially look at the generators and assuming that the zero of the generator is just a center, it doesn't have any indeterminate associated with it, I can define these nice operations on it. And in fact, what I can show is that this supremum is actually going to be greater than or equal to any point inside the zonotope, and the infimum is going to be smaller than any point. Again, what does that look like? Let's say I have this set here. Well, in fact, this is going to correspond to the supremum, and this over here is going to correspond to the infimum. Okay? And in fact, these are really fast operations on the generators that I have for my polynomial zonotope representation. In fact, I can do even more. What does the, the supremum and infimum mean for like a multidimensional set? Indeed, good question. So this should be interpreted, you know, by coordinate, so inequality per coordinate. So if I give you an analytic function, well, I can actually construct a, a polynomial zonotope that is an over approximation to that analytic function evaluated on my polynomial zonotope. So let's say I have this polynomial zonotope here. Let's say I have this function. Well, in fact, what I can do, and it's a fairly fast operation, is I can actually construct an over approximation to that function. And this object here, it's also going to be a polynomial zonotope. And generally speaking, as you've been seeing, I'll always denote a polynomial zonotope with this bold face letter. Okay. Totally. Yeah. Let me do that here. Yeah. Okay. So let's come back to our desired trajectory. Okay. So this was the picture we had earlier. Well, now what I'm going to do is I have this entire space of trajectory parameters, right? Well, because this is an analytic function, QD, in fact, what I can do is apply that arithmetic that I described earlier and actually construct this set here drawn in blue. And that set, which I'm denoting with this bold face letter, it's a polynomial zonotope who outer approximates all the trajectories that are reachable or creatable according to this desired trajectory. So, in fact, we can prove a really nice theorem to that effect. So for example, if I give you a particular trajectory here, what I can do is plug in a K here, and that K is me selecting the indeterminate. So that is also going to create a small polynomial zonotope like this one. And in fact, what we can show is that for each value of K, the true desired trajectory of the system will live inside of this plugged in small K desired trajectory, which is represented as a polynomial zonotope. And this object is going to contain an outer approximation to the trajectory of the system while it's following that small k. That's really nice because, again, these operations are going to be very quick for me to actually do in real time. So as you keep progressing a long time, the right-hand side of this brick has more and more faces. So it becomes harder and harder to verify. So in the way that I described here, it's just actually this one-dimensional object. So it's just going to be something that's defined in Rn because I'm plugging in an entire value of t. But you can imagine discretizing this interval in time and building smaller approximations to them. I don't know if that answers your question. Maybe can I ask a, a clarification? So mm -hmm. are you taking uh, the um, the um, 
uh, upper bound along the cardinal axis uh, or uh, implicitly, or, or do you maintain the entire zonotope as it evolves? We maintain the entire zonotope, mm -hmm. but they're left, I mean, the, the, in, the indeterminates are describing the effect of like you selecting a particular value. So like the indeterminates, yeah. because you're not actually pre necessarily pre-specifying them, they're just free variables that are allowed to exist. The generators, you're, you're right, you may have many, many generators associated with that you know, set of uh, indeterminates, but in fact, they're not moving, if that makes any sense. They're going to be fixed. And in fact, in the examples that we'll show you, the number of generators are typically around 50 or so. So fairly manageable for us. It's a lot of stuff here. So I apologize. I'm moving fairly quickly too. Um, the simplest idea is now, I'm going to take this ultimate bound. I'm going to take this larger polynomial zonotope. And I'm going to do the simplest thing you can imagine, which is I'm just going to add it to my polynomial zonotope. What that's going to do is just create a slightly larger set. And that slightly larger set, it's going to describe any trajectory that is actually realizable by the system using my controller. So in fact, if my initial condition starts inside of this larger set, in fact, I'll stay inside of that larger set forever. And that's the long and short of it. It's giving me a representation that I can essentially do optimization on without having to worry about reconstructing in some complicated way a priori. So, we'll call call that object QI. Yeah. That's right. So it's going to allow me to generate a reachable set for the system. And in fact, that reachable set for the system is something that I can optimize over at one time to say something about the safety. The important criteria here is that that zonotope, that larger zonotope, is actually an over approximation to the states of the system that are achievable. And that's all that matters for me. Because at the end of the day, as long as I'm conservative with this set, I can say something about the safety of the system. And in fact, these representations are going to look like polynomials when I want to do optimization. And that's actually going to be attractive for me. Yeah. Is the correct way to read this, this plot on the right that like I would drag those, those bars across straight across or along the nominal trajectory or? So in this particular instance, what I've just shown is me compactifying over all time. So it's just like as if I have a single set representation. Mm -hmm. Um, if you look at this paper down here, which is on archive, you'll see a representation where we sort of show you what it looks like along the trajectory of the system. And in that instance, it'll look like it's moving. And why is that different? Well, getting back to Pratik's point, what you're doing then is you're plugging in particular values for those indeterminates, and that's giving you a slice of what this polynomial zone looks like. Did you have a question? No, I didn't. Okay. <laughs> Um, so, um, again, the really cool thing is we can do really nice arithmetic with this. So again, if I do a slice here, um, that's going to correspond, for example, for a particular joint to a rotation matrix. And in fact, that rotation matrix is going to look something like this. secret so that you can view the high dimensional yeah, so that's a good question. So what? how are we able to get up to this sort of 50-dimensional systems that I'll hopefully show later? The key idea is, is a mix of these two, which is using this robust controller to really say something about the behavior of you know, the tracking performance, right. and then using a representation for what the forward occupancy of this space looks like. And that can be done in a really nice way using these polynomial zonotopes. It's a mixture really of those two things. The last thing I'll mention is that that polynomial or this uh, recursive Dean Euler algorithm allows you to elegantly compute all of these reachable sets without having to do lots of additional compositions and whatnot. So if I give you a kinematic chain, it allows you to do the arithmetic elegantly without having to build a really large inertia matrix, for instance. So the long and short of it, and I'm close to running out of time here, so I may jump ahead a little, is essentially we can build these rotations matrix polynomial zonotopes. And what they'll correspond to is me taking the link volume, for example, multiplying it by this object, and actually, of course, generating the forward occupancy of the system. Again, this operation, it just requires me to take this particular polynomial zonotope and evaluate the cosine and sine of it, because that is an analytic function. Again, I can build a Taylor series approximation to it. 
I can do that operation fast enough to be able to build this rotation matrix and then do this multiplication, which is just me multiplying two polynomial zonotopes together. Again, by building this sort of set representation that allows us to do multiplication and evaluation of analytic functions quickly, I can actually do these operations rapidly enough for me to actually be able to do things that I care about. So I can keep doing this. For example, if I have another link volume, you know, I could try to construct this, this object here, which is going to correspond to a version of the forward occupancy for this link. Of course, I would be missing sort of the translation due to the first link and the rotation due to the first joint. But in fact, I knew from forward kinematics that essentially you just need to do this operation to construct the next joint location. And then you need to construct this rotation volume. And in fact, you can do those operations together like this to essentially construct the swept volume. All of these operations I've described here are essentially things that we do on polynomial zonotopes, things that I defined earlier, Minkowski sum and multiplication, things that I can do rapidly, stacking generators together. So that's the long and short of it. I can essentially take these polynomial zonotopes for trajectories and then slice them, meaning plug in a particular trajectory parameter, and then I can construct a polynomial zonotope that contains the forward occupancy of the robot. And in fact, we're able to do that on the order of a few you know, thousand hertz. And in fact, that allows us to construct a forward occupancy for this kind of seven dot robot really well. All right. um, given that I'm, I'm close to running out of time here, what I'm gonna do here dangerously is maybe jump ahead here for just a second and actually jump to the examples for this uh, for the system. But the long and short of it is um, with that set of operations, I can do self-intersection, joint checking. I can ensure that I avoid obstacles, et cetera. Those are all going to be, again, operations of taking like infimums, maximums, et cetera, of polynomial zonotopes, which are, again, fast things for me to do. So this is going to allow us to prove a theorem about how we perform in terms of safety and how we should do receding horizon planning again, in the presence of model uncertainty. So I'm just going to jump to the experiments to show what that looks like a little bit. So the first example is this one here. This is us doing sort of armor on a really classic robot, the fetch, right? Six off, so a 12-dimensional system. What you're going to see is us generating the reachable set of the system. And in fact, we're going to give waypoints, that is the high-level planner is going to generate waypoints that are in collision with this object, which is the you know, table. And in fact, we're still going to be able to do planning in this situation and still be able to say something about the safety of the planner. And you're going to see that here. So those black things flashing are essentially waypoints generated by some random high-level planner, not a very good one. It's in collision many of the times, but in fact, because we're using this reachable set, we're actually able to say that we'll never run into this object, us, uh, this table, while still trying to get as close as possible to that waypoint. In fact, we can do more, as I mentioned. So now you're going to see an example. This plan, oh, do this. So you're going to see an example now where we're going to introduce a little bit more complexity here. So this video is a single take. All the planning is done in real time. Obstacles are random. Uh, we're using a motion capture setup for now. We're using an RT for a high-level planner. This is, again, what the robot planner view looks like. This is what the real-time camera view looks like. We're creating a hologram here for these objects so that you can sort of see, see through them. And in fact, what's going to end up happening here is we're going to show our initial position. And you're going to see the tracking performance and whatnot. And again, the weight that's at the end of this object is not known perfectly by the robot. In fact, we've introduced model error throughout. That is, we don't know perfectly what the model looks like in this instance. Okay? And in this instance, I believe it's 3%. And this is what the ultimate bound looks like in this example. And they're going to slowly start adding more complexity here, like adding obstacles and whatnot. And again, like all great robot videos, you're going to see that it performs well in this instance, right? Okay. And, you know, this is amazing. You know, obviously it's going to perform well, et cetera, et cetera. They'll add more objects and things will happen. Great. Okay. So we did a long comparison. Again, you can play around with it and take a look at the paper down here. We compared it to CHOMP, which is a type of doing receding horizon planning, or you can treat it as a receding horizon planner if you, if you do it well. We're going to give it access to the true inertial parameters just to give it a boost and see how well it can perform if it knows everything perfectly about the world. Right? In that instance, Chomp succeeds about 87% of the time and it crashes about 13% of the time. 
The original version of RTB, it actually succeeds 76% of the time, but crashes about 0% of the time. That was using that conservative representation of the model, right? And in fact, armor, which doesn't have access to the true delta, it only has the interval, which is about 5% in this example, is able to succeed 93% of the time. It, it, part of that is it has a much tighter representation because it's actually playing around with the full dynamics and it doesn't crash at all. But how much is it uh, in terms of percentage is the delta? The delta in this instance was about 5%. Yeah, so in that instance, you know, I think the weight it was holding on to in that previous version was about three pounds. So, yeah. So, you know, ooh, this didn't come up right. I'll have to play around with this. We actually ran it through several really hard scenarios like this one. Thin obstacles and things like that tend to be really hard for most motion planners that are discretizing in time, right? You can imagine that they essentially plan right through it because they don't worry about the dynamics of the system between time instances, right? And so, in fact, in these examples, CHOMP consistently crashes, we know. And again, CHOMP in this instance has perfect access to the model. It really knows everything about the system. In fact, we've been able to push this idea even further. So one of the things we've been playing around with now is actually constructing reach sets for the forces we generate as we're moving an object. So you can imagine if I'm doing some sort of waiter service, right? I'm moving this object and I'm actually managing the forces I'm generating as I'm moving this object. Well, one of the interesting things we can do here is actually see if we can construct reach sets for the forces that we're applying into the system here. So can we know that this object won't flip over? And you can imagine that that's the type of question you want to be able to answer if you're generating a walking robot walking along. You need to know the forces you're applying into the ground to make sure that you're not slipping, for instance, right? So in fact, we've been able to generate these wrench reachable sets. I'll show you what they look like, for instance, when you don't have them active. So here's our robot. It's trying to do a little bit of waiter service here. It's trying to move this object over. And you'll see after some moment in time, it doesn't have a wrench reach set now. And so, in fact, it's going to slip because it's choosing a motion plan that's actually not so great, right? But in fact, if you start introducing these wrench reach sets, and now basically the model of the system goes from a sixth off system to a seventh off system. And in fact, in this instance, we have a 14 dimensional model of the state space of the system and we're constructing a reach set for the system. In this case, it knows what are the forces it's generating as it's moving, and it can manage those forces to ensure that it doesn't create any tipping. In fact, We've actually been able to apply it to other systems. So this is an eight-dimensional autonomous vehicle model. And in fact, in this case, you're going to see we can generate. This is a full-on vehicle model using you know, side slip, everything. Um, and we're actually able to generate motion plans for this. And this is work that we've done with Ford. So a slightly different paper. And in fact, Yifei up here can tell you more about it. And one of the things we can show is really the differences between this armor reach set, which is really tight and looks like it's capable of essentially doing lane changes versus, you know, something like our original version of RTD, which is using polynomials because it sums of the squares. And these polynomials are quite over approximative. They can still allow you to do nice things, but sometimes they can run into problems because they're so large. Right? And in fact, you know, we've compared it to a bunch of different other algorithms like NMPC, for instance, which struggles essentially trying to operate in real time. In fact, we've done lots of comparisons in this instance, and um, you know, we've shown that essentially we can ensure the safety of the system, you know, quite reliably. We can get lots of successes. We can travel fairly fast, and the representations we're generating are small enough for us to actually be able to put on a car and have them operate well. You know. Getting back to sort of alternatives that people have thought about, you know, one of the things many people ask us about is, why do you need this continuum? Why is that useful? So one of the things we did was compare this paper to that earlier algorithm that I mentioned by Matthias Altoff, where essentially we sample a bunch of trajectories and we build different funnels for each of those trajectories. In fact, that can be a really hard thing to do because how densely do you sample in order to generate that line gray? Well, in fact, what we've shown um, is you know, you can choose a sparse sampling or a dense sampling. The dense sampling can improve your performance a little bit, right? But it really starts eating into your memory. It's quite a big set of funnels that you have to hold on to. And in that instance, holding on to this continuum object where you can plug in indeterminates may be a much more effective or lucrative way to actually do motion planning. And in fact, Ife up here actually has taken this work and actually, uh, as part of his time at Michigan, went to Ford and actually put it on a vehicle. This isn't the video, but talk to this guy and he can actually show you it working and actually translating. And in fact, some of this work is actually translating into Ford's Blue Cruise work that they're actually using to sort of uh, act as an alternative to, you know, Tesla's autopilot. 
Um, as I mentioned, you know, we've been able to do even more here. So this is digit and it's in simulation for now. Um, and in fact, here we're constructing a reach set for digit that's in the all of its bottom portion of its body. So in fact, it's not quite 54 dimensional, although we can actually do the arm ones as well. But the ground ones at this moment, I think, are in 36 dimensions. So it's actually quite a large reach set. All of this planning and whatnot are done in real time. We're actually, again, able to ensure all of those nice safety things that we care about, despite model uncertainty, despite all of these other challenges that people typically have. I'll mention one last thing, which is, you know, we've also been pushing on showing that we can take these polynomial zonotopes and represent them as a neural network. And in fact, that can do really nice things. So in fact, I had hoped um, Nadia would be here because this is actually her paper that inspired us. She had this really beautiful idea. I, I am here like, on Zoom. <laughs> it's really great. It basically constructed this deep neural network to represent the sign distance function between you know, different configurations and an object that exists out there. And we thought, hey, how do we extend this idea? And we thought about taking our reach set representation, that polynomial zonotope one, and building a sign distance function representation to obstacles. And in fact, we can train it using sort of this mean squared error and I can loss, which I can talk to you more about. But the really cool thing is, you know, again, we can really start increasing the time or decreasing the time it takes to actually do this optimization quite a bit. And so in fact, you know, we can keep a pretty high success rate and operate on the order of about 40 hertz now by using this neural network representation. Again, not for saying something about representing a complicated system, but instead about doing really quick inference, right? And using that inference capability to actually speed up optimization. And importantly, and this is the thing you should expect to see when you see a neural network side is how often does it create a crash? Like, are you actually building a conservative representation? In fact, empirically, we can show that we are. But the question is, can we actually guarantee conservativeness of this neural network? And what I'll say is, stay tuned. In a few weeks, we should post up a paper where we can actually prove a theorem about the quality of the neural network. So that's all I have to say. I'm a few minutes over. I apologize. These are the people who actually do the really hard work here. I will point out, you know, again, John here and Boha have done a lot of the work here. John is excellent, um, and so is Boha. And so, if you guys are are looking to to keep an eye on talented students coming forward, I would say those two are really worth keeping an eye on. These are our funders, um, and then I'll end with, you know, this last sort of set of plugs, and really this one here, which is go and play with our code and see how it breaks or works and whatnot. And that's the best, you know, sort of advice or help I we can get. So thank you. Oh. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, from my understanding, you're focusing on the parametric uncertainty. Sure. How can you deal with um, unstructured uncertainty, which usually you would also have maybe in this problem of a smaller magnitude? Yeah, so that's a really good question. So um, we played around with uncertainty of that kind in the environment. And in that instance, we're doing things like basically like a risk aware version of a lot of the work that we presented here. Um, yeah, I, I think I can show you some slides offline. Trying to actually build a reach set that has that stochasticity built into it is a really hard problem. Um, I have some students who really want to do that. It's quite difficult. So um, what I would say is like, I think there's a lot of interesting stuff to do there, but really hard. Yeah. So for this beast example you showed, uh, I assume like there the velocities are not analytic because you're like building up this thing like that. Yeah, so in fact, what we do is we parameterize not only the desired trajectory, but also the desired velocity, which I didn't show here. Mm -hmm. And so both of those things are actually desired trajectories that we parameterize. Um, and so I hid that detail here for simplicity, but in fact, both of those things are actually part of our desired trajectory vector. I see, but like, how does that make the velocity analytic in that case? Um, the desired trajectory can be, we can choose to make it analytic. Oh, it's just the desired one. Just the desired oh, one. Not, the, not the actual one. Yeah, oh, yeah. the see. actual one, obviously, we can't really say anything oh, about it. It's just the desired one. Um, uh, I have a philosophical question sure. because this is about uncertainty in your uh, in your dynamic calibration, right? mm -hmm. pretty much. Yeah. What about uh, uncertainty, which honestly, myself, I always assume that's pretty certain when we yeah. experiment. What about, for example, uncertainty when uh, you have uh, when you follow a trajectory and you have a visual odometry where uh, you have uh, error in your state? 
Yeah. So in fact, so uh, there's two things I want to say there. So one thing here I should mention is that um, so when we do this receding horizon planning, in the past, we would make this assumption that we needed to know what the future state of our system was, right? Meaning the future actual location of our robot is. In fact, in this work, we don't need to do that anymore. We just need to know what our the, the final desired state is, because we have this ultimate bound that we stay inside. That answers sort of one of your questions, but it's it's a little bit cheating. But the second question is a really good one, which is like, you may not actually, you know, you're building a feedback controller here. Maybe your your state estimation is not accurate, and you need to be able to manage that state estimation uncertainty. Yeah, in that instance, you know, there's a lot of hard and difficult questions. I would point back at the, the answer I gave Manfred earlier, which is some of that is related to some version of managing stochasticity in your model itself. And you need to be able to incorporate that stochasticity in your model directly and not treat it just as a parametric thing, but maybe something more explicit, like something that's time varying. Again, I have some students who are exploring that. It's a really hard question. Give us, you know, a little bit of time. I think it's a really area, interesting area. How do you have the situation to the error between full model and the simplified model? So there is no simplified model in the in this portion, right? So I've thrown that model away. It's all, all full order model, but what I've done is now allow the full order model to have uncertainty, parametric uncertainty in it. And the re the reason is, I mean, getting back to Costa's question, you know, like when I take digit, in fact, I know, you know, we run experiments, the digit model that is handed to us is wrong. And in fact, we can manage it. I can tell you how wrong it roughly is, but it's definitely wrong. Um, and trying to do SysID to try to identify, you know, a model better, turned out to be quite difficult for the system because many of the spring parameters, for example, you could imagine as the system heats up, meaning the spring warms up, actually the spring constant is varying. And that becomes a really serious problem for us. Now, generally that's around one or 2% model uncertainty, but that is large enough for the reach sets we're constructing to be quite wrong unless we were able to deal with model uncertainty directly. How long can they be? Like what's the maximum percentage of delta that you can get? Yeah, so I mean, in this case, we've run up to five or you know 10% we've played around with. Again, the larger it becomes, you know, there's sort of a, an implicit trade-off here. Um, one is you can choose a parameter, like a control parameter that decides what that ultimate bound is. However, if your model uncertainty is very large, you could try to make that parameter very large, but then your control effort would have to also be very large. And so you'd be limited by the actuation limits. I haven't described how we incorporate actuation limits here, but in fact, that is doable. So like we can add that as an, another constraint in our optimization problem. But that's kind of the trade-off that you face, right? The larger model uncertainty you have, potentially the larger control effort you would need to keep that model uncertainty managed. Any last questions? Oh. Is there a way you can to like, like, like kind of like this question before, like how, how does uh, this, this framework, like this is the integral of my parameters and it's definitely inside this and definitely not outside of it. Like you see a world which is a more Bayesian perspective on that? I do. Um, we have a paper that one of my students has written on this topic. I'm being a little uh, uh, flaky here purposefully because it's in review and it's uh, you know sort of one of those double blind things for now. Mm -hmm. um, but what I would say is like we have some perspective on how to do that. What I would say is the, you know, we can tell you a lot about the most informative experiment that you probably want to find, right? Um, and we have a way to manage the risk associated with you choosing a particular action. We can compute an integral over the reach set and do lots of really nice things. But taking that uncertainty and then propagating it back through my model to generate a new reach set, that's a really hard problem. So like that turns out to be sort of one of these fundamental, really, really difficult problems. But I think George this morning, when I was meeting with him, was talking about, you know, basically using PDEs and solving PDEs really rapidly uh, using neural networks. It's an interesting idea. Um, what I would say is like these types of problems more naturally relate to basically a PDE representation of the dynamics of the system. I'll leave it at that for now. Thanks. Actually, I have one last question. Sure. Um, so if I were to transfer, I want to send my uh, reachable space to my teammate. How much information do I need to send? Yeah, so that's, that's good. Um, in the first thing, um, again, we are generating the reach sets front mostly online. Mm -hmm. So like the example that I was showing there, you know, where we have like a 700 megabyte thing is like a, a rough estimate of what that would look like mm -hmm. um, for that system. 
Um, yeah, so uh, we haven't published it yet, but that um, what I was saying, you know, stay tuned. Um, one of the things we've been able to do is essentially generate kind of a, a neural network representation for this problem, as I mentioned, right? Mm -hmm. There we can give you a much tighter bound on how many, how big it, it's going to be mm -hmm. on the order of like megabytes. Yeah. But um, more to be said here, I would say. Ram, I have one, I have one final question, if I may. Um, so in terms of the, um, like the neural implicit um, uh, representation that you are, but you're learning kind of like the reachable set, right? Um, and so from my experience, it's uh, the computation time really increases as, as the number of obstacles increase and as the number of degrees of freedom of your robot increases, and also if the obstacles are moving. So I, I was just wondering, uh, I think, uh, uh, yeah, I didn't get to see the last videos because the, the presentation uh, was is not oh. showing on Zoom, but could you handle dynamic obstacles? Yeah, so we haven't played around with dynamic obstacles yet. Um, so what I would say is number of obstacles hasn't been too much of a problem. In these examples, I was showing 10 or 20, you know, 10, I think was this table here. We've been able to get up to 20 or 30 without any problems. Doing the dynamic version, I don't think we've played around with in this paper yet, but um, uh, again, uh, I think in a few weeks, we'll show you something where we're able to do, uh, manage dynamic obstacles well. Okay. I'll send the paper to you once it's out, Nadia. Yeah, that'd be great. <laughs> Thanks. For sure. Let's thank uh, Ram again.